I do think that melatonin can justifiably be a nutrient. We need it. Similar to like vitamin D being used for so many different things, we need to sometimes correct our levels of vitamin D, very similar with melatonin. And from puberty on, it starts to go down, 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 down. It doesn't go back up. Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and our guest today is Dr. Diana Minnick. Diana is a nutrition scientist, author, and certified functional medicine practitioner. She serves as the chief science officer at Symphony Natural Health, which offers the world's first plant melatonin made of phytomelatonin. Herbatonin has been demonstrated to have 470% stronger antioxidant properties and 640% greater anti anti-inflammatory effect than synthetic melatonin. Herbatonin is my go-to melatonin for better sleep and the longevity benefits of melatonin. To try out Herbatonin, head over to symphonynaturalhealth.com and use the code SEAM10 for a 10% discount. Diana, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to be here with you. Yes, I'm excited to have you on the podcast because, you know, we've been up or I've been talking a lot about melatonin on my channel and like a lot of the longevity and health benefits of that as a hormone and as a supplement. But, you know, there's so much, let's say, misconceptions about melatonin. And for sure, like there's a lot of problems with the melatonin industry, if you can call it like that, or like the melatonin market. It's like not very well regulated. So I'm glad to have you on the podcast as like, uh, like a very knowledgeable and expert on uh, melatonin and uh, just you know share people about everything related to how do you supplement that and you know what are the other things people need to like know about great yeah as a scientist i feel really comfortable talking about the scientific mechanisms we can talk about clinical applications and mm. then of course what you just mentioned like the practicality of it like how do you actually supplement how do you choose a supplement what's the dose Mm-hmm. Are you going to stop your body's production? You know, all of those things that I've had so many questions about over the past year. Yeah. So, but we can, we can start like, what's, how did you got into this? Like what made you interested in melatonin and uh, yeah, like what are some other things related to your background? Yeah, great question. So I'm chief science officer at Symphony Natural Health. So I began working with Symphony about a year and a half ago and they have a plant melatonin. And so by way of understanding melatonin through the work that I was doing with them, I got even more intrigued. But I would say it actually went back even further. During the pandemic, I was monitoring a lot of the nutrition science as it related to the immune system, noticing that there was a lot of discussion about vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, quercetin, and melatonin, which I thought was really fascinating. And so in my nutrition science mind, I began to look at melatonin as a nutrient, like a circadian nutrient. So that <laughs> that resulted in the publication of a, um, uh, of a long review article looking at melatonin as the next vitamin D. And that we published as a team back in September of 2022 in the Nutrients Journal. So that has been my trajectory into all things melatonin. Mm, nice. Actually, uh... I actually found that that study as well that you authored uh, melatonin as a new vitamin D, which yep. is a interesting concept. And uh, you know, I personally think that as a hormone, you know, vitamin D is a hormone actually, not a vitamin. But you know, melatonin as a hormone is equally as important as vitamin D. Like vitamin D is like the master hormone inside the body, but melatonin is like the master antioxidant in in some ways. And I think it's more even powerful than uh, glutathione, for example, in terms of the antioxidant uh, properties. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And you know, what I think is so interesting in the health field is that many times we just want to pigeonhole a compound like melatonin or like vitamin D or like quercetin or like polyphenols. And then we soon come to realize, wow, they're pleiotropic. They're doing lots of different things. They're not just doing one thing. And I think that melatonin has been pigeonholed into being a hormone and then people are fearful of it. They feel like, oh my gosh, we should be really cautious about it. But yet it's everywhere. It is in nature. It's in animals. It's in the human body. So I think that there's greater nuance and complexity Mm. as it really relates to understanding melatonin and all of these different nutrients. Mm. Yeah. So we we can start like, you know, what is melatonin or, you know, what's the role of melatonin in, in the body? Like besides just, you know, some of the things that we talked about already. Yeah. So melatonin, um, if we think of the name mela, 
melatonin. It was actually coined by a dermatologist back in the late 1950s. He was looking for a skin lightening agent. And there were some earlier papers that were published showing that when the pineal gland of animals was put into a vat of frogs, that basically the frog's skin had lightened or its, oh. you know, its, uh, its color. So he became interested in that led him to coin this this molecule mela which is related to the skin and then tonin because it had a biochemical structure that was very similar to serotonin so that's how melatonin came into it so but actually it is a neurohormone in the classical sense it's produced throughout the body. I mean, quite honestly, it's it's everywhere. It's widespread. It's in the brain. It's in the retina. It's in the skin, just like that dermatologist was looking into. It didn't, by the way, end up being a skin lightening agent, but it is in the skin, which is very similar to where we see vitamin D. Hmm. It is throughout most of the body um, organs. It's uh, highly concentrated in the mitochondria. We have receptors on cells that receive melatonin, and so people can have genetic variants that relate to their activity of melatonin. And I would say that the two main organs that produce melatonin in our human bodies would be the pineal gland is the one that most people think of because we get into the pineal gland producing it in response to darkness, but actually the gut produces 400 times the mm. level that the pineal gland does. So they both work a little bit differently. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting that the gut has such a massive <laughs> like production of uh, melatonin because, you know, historically it's always thought to be produced in the in the pineal gland, like you said, but uh, you know, that goes to show that there's many things that affect the melatonin production, not just the light cue through the circadian rhythms. That's true. And in fact, um, one of the differences with the pineal gland derived melatonin is that that's a true endocrine hormone. So when that is released from the pineal gland, it gets transmitted throughout the body and then it goes to the cells and starts to regulate the clock genes, right? To bring us into circadian rhythm. On the other hand, the gut, when it produces melatonin, it's typically an autocrine or a paracrine effect, meaning that it has more of a localized effect. So it can have some changes in the function of the gastrointestinal tract. So we know that the immune system is mostly housed in the gut, like 60 to 70% of the immune system. So it seems like melatonin is having an impact there. It may also be impacting the secretion of the the, the gastrointestinal system. So things like enzymes or, you know, any any number of different maybe neurohormones, it may play a role in motility. And some of the more emerging research would suggest that it's playing a role in the gut microbiome modulation. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like we, we actually know a lot of how that's all happening, but a lot of the uh, research that's being done is looking at its role in the gut and why indeed it is so high in the gut. Mm. Yeah. So what are, what are like, um, or actually, like I remember some um, rat study that um, found that melatonin has like antioxidant properties. And uh, in that particular study, they, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, I think they like exposed the testes of the rats to like some sort of a stressor and melatonin had like antioxidant or reduced the oxidative stress in the testes. So it's like, <laughs> it's a very powerful like antioxidant in of itself. But um, what what are like you know you know you may, we talked about the let's say the mechanisms and the functions of melatonin as a hormone. But what are like some of the research about melatonin as a supplement? Like because obviously many people use it as a supplement. So what are what are some of the like research the benefits of that, or is it like safe after all? Yeah. Well, I mean. Be First of all, I mean, if we look at the functions of melatonin, and you just spoke to its role as a powerful antioxidant, um, it has basically six functions. So if we think like as a scientist and just think of what is it doing in the body, then we can translate into, okay, where would it be good for people? You mm. know, first and foremost, it's an incredibly potent antioxidant. In fact, it's been shown that one molecule of melatonin 
and its metabolites can actually scavenge up to 10 free radicals. And that's big because most of these other antioxidants like vitamin C or even vitamin E can't do that particular uh, robust job of scavenging. Usually they can just do one, two, um, you know, just a few of them. And I think in part, it's because melatonin is both fat soluble and water soluble. So it can go to a lot of different places in the body. So we'll come back to that when we talk about the brain. But I do like what you said about, you know, the fact that it is so powerful. It's even more powerful in some ways than glutathione. Um, we see that melatonin can stimulate the production of glutathione and antioxidant defense enzymes. So if we think about health conditions, we would think, well, where would you see oxidative stress? Where do you see mitochondrial dysfunction? And typically all the diseases related to aging are some ways, uh, in, in some way, shape or form connected to um, to, to melatonin through the, the mitochondria, right? So we think of things like neurotoxicity. We think of things like cardiometabolic health. We think of even digestive health. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's pivotal. I would say it's, there probably isn't a function in the body that it's not used for and there wouldn't be a clinical application. You know, in that paper that you saw, you know, we primarily talked about the role in the central nervous system because there's a lot of data there. So when I say central nervous system, I'm talking about circadian rhythm modulation, sleep-wake disorders, and any kind of sleep disturbance, but also away from sleep, looking at cognitive conditions, migraines, tinnitus, autism, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, even eye disorders. And I think that number two, when I look and just stack up the evidence on melatonin and its clinical applications, I would also see that there could be use for the immune system because it is part of the immune system. So we look at autoimmune conditions and there's more and more research there, you know, and even during the pandemic, there was exploration, as I mentioned, into the use of melatonin for COVID, but now also for long COVID, looking at, um, you know, its chemo preventative uses, you know, even inflammatory conditions as it relates to bone and, um, you know, the reproductive system, the heart, the cardiovascular system. Mm. So I would say that, um, you know, most people think of it for the brain and circadian rhythm, but there's a lot of other applications. You mentioned the testes. And so, especially when we look at infertility, what we see is that there could be a mechanism related to infertility that involves oxidative stress. So when somebody has mitochondrial dysfunction, they're not able to deal with a lot of the free radicals that are produced, then there can be an issue. There's an overwhelm. And so melatonin is produced in high concentrations in the mitochondria. And we think that it most likely plays that role in helping to reduce oxidative stress and a lot of the, the free radicals that are flying as a result. Mm. Yeah, so it's like a most very powerful antioxidant. Um, but what, why does, or you know, do you think that a lot of the those benefits come from the melatonin's ability to re reduce oxidative stress, or is there something else like central to melatonin that you know? Why would you see such a like a systemic improvement um, through like melatonin, if that makes sense? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, because melatonin, first of all, is is in most body tissues and fluids. So it's, um, you know, it, it's right there to do the job. And it's not just an antioxidant, but it's also anti-inflammatory. It is um, connected to, if we look at the cell, it's changing how the cell not just through the mitochondria, but just in general through its presence, it's changing things like viral replication, the accumulation of proteins like amyloid. So it's able to regulate a lot of different processes. In fact, if you look at even agriculture, they use melatonin as a growth factor for plants to help to produce more mm. th of things like phytochemicals. So why is it used throughout all of these? You know, why would we see that? Because first of all, of its location, it's in just about all body tissues and fluids, and it's serving like six different functions. Mm. And so I think that's why it's so integral to so many of these different health conditions. Gotcha. Um... So, but what about like sleep? 
Um, yeah. How does it affect sleep and what is, what's the research about uh, sleep? Yeah, well, and you know, that's where most people know about its role is through sleep, right? Um, and I would say even just to back up from sleep, it's really about circadian rhythm modulation. So the beauty of melatonin is that it's the darkness hormone when we think about sleep. So we, as the light becomes dimmer, so let's just imagine like we wake up with the light that already helps our melatonin if we if our eyes see that bright light and then we go through the day and then let's just say that around 6 p.m depending on the time of the year it starts to get a little bit more dim and we start to produce more and more melatonin from the pineal gland as our body senses that it's dim and then eventually it goes into nighttime so how does it play a role in sleep well we have the highest amounts of endogenous melatonin at the peak of darkness, which is about 2 to 4 a.m. And what I think is also really interesting as it relates to sleep, you know, we, we see that it can impact REM sleep. It can impact dream states. It can also help to remove neurotoxins through the glymphatic fluid, which I know that you know about, right? So when we sleep, we see that there's greater convection into this interstitial space around the brain, allowing for the detoxification of the brain matter. So we can move things out of the brain better, things like toxic amyloid, things like hyperphosphorylated tau proteins. We get that stuff out. And it looks like, at least through preclinical studies, that melatonin is playing a role in that transport out of the brain. And there is some um, very interesting work being done in animals and in cell studies showing that it may even help with helping to fortify the integrity of the, the, blush, the, the blood brain barrier. So, you know, when we think of leaky gut, leaky brain, so essentially what we see is that melatonin may be helping with decreasing the permeability of that blood brain barrier. So I think that all of these things are helping with sleep. You know, we know that inflammation ties into how a person sleeps. If a person has neuroinflammation, they're going to have more issues with sleep. So what melatonin is doing, I believe, through its many different functions, is it's also helping to reduce the fire within, the inflammation within. It's helping to recalibrate, reset, and get our immune system back into balance at night. Right. So, you know, we need that time. And that's why we can't shortcut sleep. We need to get the full capacity of melatonin to do its job and to work together with glutathione and some of the other antioxidant enzymes, which are also peaking at night. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting that uh, growth hormone and even like the process of autophagy, which is also yeah. another like cell like clearance uh, mechanism that also like uh, is regulated by melatonin in your sleep so like you know when you look at the circadian rhythms and you know if you also look at it from like evolutionary perspective then it makes sense that your body is trying to be efficient with repair and sleep and uh, recovery so it just clumps it all together at the time where it's most effective to do so when your body is like resting and uh, then the melatonin as a, like a master hormone in that scenario is like coordinating all these other, uh, you know, repair processes in your sleep, which, you know, makes it such such an important role for melatonin as a hormone itself, yes. or just in your sleep, but also like, you know, anti-aging and longevity and other like just metabolic health overall. You totally get it. And you said that beautifully, right? And that's why, you know, when people are thinking, oh, you know, melatonin, you know, it's, it's we... We need to be careful. And, um, you know, I feel like people don't understand the full breadth of what melatonin is about, because even through the life cycle, if we look at the endogenous production of melatonin, so you're talking about aging and, you know, kind of autophagy and maximizing, optimizing internal processes. Well, as we go through the life cycle and, you know, within three months of age, we start to see an uptick of melatonin. Right. So the, the melatonin starts to increase when we are children and it peaks until about puberty. And from puberty on, it starts to go down, 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 down. It doesn't go back up. <laughs> so it's like some of the other hormones. So by the time that we are in middle age, we're down from, you know, as a child, our 
pineal gland might produce something like close to one milligram. Now in middle age, we're probably at 0.3 milligrams. And then we move into the 50s and we're at like 0.1 milligrams where, you know, some of us are even bottomed out. And you could say, you know, is that connected to the rise of chronic diseases that are associated with accelerated aging, which start Mm -hmm. to come up and up and up at about that time of life, right? Not to say that everything is related to low melatonin, but I think it can be a contributor and it's something that we have to look at. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I know we're actually, you know, this, this is something that came into my mind right now, but you know, you're totally right about the fact that yeah like melatonin levels decrease after puberty and i'm glad that you um, brought out the amount that or that we make when we are children and in puberty like i didn't know exactly how much we were making when we are in our teenage years uh, but i by the way i didn't i did know that when we're adults we make around you know 0.1 0.3 milligrams uh, per night but you know if you look at the safety from the safety profile then you know taking even like 1 milligram of melatonin is because your body already makes that much when you're a teenager and when you're a teenager your your risk of any disease is very low and you produce the most melatonin so just looking at it from that perspective then even as an adult taking some melatonin as a supplement is probably you know very safe in that sense at least in the doses of you know a few milligrams because your body already makes that much when you're a teenager and actually that large amount of, large amount of melatonin produced in your teenage years and childhood is actually what's you know keeping your body very young and healthy like your your risk of these diseases is very small and you're metabolically healthy because your body is very you know able to recover from all the stressors and inflammation super fast uh, whereas when you're adult when you're an adult then that that ability like just decreases uh, gradually absolutely uh you, you know 100 percent, and that's why you know many times in the biohacking world there's discussion about taking double digits of melatonin as a Mm. supplement. And I, I have some hesitation about that because I almost think of it like the Goldilocks principle. The Goldilocks principle is not too little, not too much, just right. Because otherwise we can go to the other place where we could have imbalance, right? Mm. And so what we know has been studied in longer term studies is below 10 milligrams, below 10 milligrams, and for sure, much more around the one milligram mark, if not even, you know, below and also just a little bit above if we're looking at jet lag. But when people are taking like 20, 30, 50 milligrams, um, you know, I don't know, you know, melatonin can also have some immunostimulatory effects. And, um, you know, there might be some backlash of taking too high amounts for a a long period because we we just don't know now if that if a higher amount is used like under clinical care because it actually has and there have been some studies looking at people for example undergoing chemotherapy or you know certain indications where it's just being taken at a higher dose for a short period of time we do have some research on that, but we just don't have long-term data on double digits of melatonin. More is not always better. And we know that. Right. Yeah. Well, at least, you know, moderate doses are perfectly safe and, you know, your body is very, you know, you you have like the immune system memory or the, your body, body remembers what it's like to have larger amounts of melatonin. But it's, yeah, like it's just with age, you see this uh, drop in melatonin. And like you said, it coincidentally, all the other diseases also go up, which are all characterized by oxidative stress and inflammation. <laughs> so like, what do you think? Like is some, you know, obviously there's a lifestyle can affect that to a certain extent that uh, with a healthier lifestyle, you're able to maintain the melatonin production for longer and higher amounts of it. But, um, you know, do you think that adults, especially elderly people who have very little melatonin, is it like then a smart idea for them to like supplement it at that age, like in their 60s or 70s? I would even see see that that could be something that could be discussed with that person at a younger age than 60s or 70s. I'm talking like 30s. Mm. <laughs> and um, here are some of the things that go into personalizing a supplement, right? So first, we have to look at a person's lifestyle 
Like, are they a shift worker? If they're a shift worker, they have flip-flopped their circadian rhythm, and they are more at risk for these diseases of aging than somebody who's not doing shift work. So we need to look at lifestyle. We need to look at the stress level because there is a dynamic balance between cortisol and melatonin. And so for people that are trying to convert tryptophan in the body, so if just to back up a second, melatonin needs to be made in the body upon the signal. So what makes melatonin in the body is first having tryptophan going through a series of enzymes, you know, you see serotonin and then eventually you get to melatonin. So if people do not have proper nutrition to drive that through, so we need things like zinc and magnesium. There's a methyl transferase that's involved in that production of melatonin. So if you don't have good, healthy nutrition, then that conversion will not be robust. You know, some people have gene variants in methyl transferases, as an example. Some people have gene variants in even how they metabolize melatonin. And so tryptophan, 95% of tryptophan is being used for energy and other things in the body. So under stress, we use even more of that tryptophan in order to get energy currency and other things. We move more of it away from melatonin, and that's called the kynurenin pathway. So 95% goes through the kynurenin pathway for energy, NAD, and then only 5% is dedicated to serotonin and melatonin. So it just depends on how stressed we are, how much artificial blue light do we expose our eyes to. And you know what else? Most people don't realize this. This is two interesting tidbits that I haven't told many people yet. One is that the color of your eyes can also determine your sensitivity to artificial blue light at night and be something that you want to consider as it relates to your need for melatonin. So essentially, there was a study that showed that people with blue, green, and light brown eyes were even more susceptible to the suppression of melatonin production from artificial blue light exposure because you know i have green eyes so like i'm very sensitive to light many times i have to wear sunglasses and you know so the same thing will apply at night so you're going to be even more sensitive at night if you have light eyes compared to somebody with darker eyes Hmm. Um, the other thing that can change one thing i don't tell a lot of people um, this is a, a study though where they did it in a sleep lab and they found that irrespective of your exposure to light through your eyes that from the moon cycle so you know i always say that rhythms run us and one of the rhythms is the lunar rhythm we see that you know usually we talk about that a lot more with women in the menstrual cycle but melatonin and the moon are also synced up so for four days before and four days after a full moon we naturally have very low melatonin levels and Mm. if you think about it many people report that they don't sleep well Mm. during the full moon And many people just chalk that up to, well, it's just because I can see the light and, you know, (laughs) Mm. but there may actually be something more. So, yeah, there was a study on that that I thought was really interesting. Wow. That's super interesting. Yeah, like that makes sense. Or that explains the the reporting of uh, loss of sleep during the full moon. Um, So is it more like connected to the Earth's position or like the electromagnetic field of the Earth or... How does it like affect through the lunar moon? I don't know if we know. I mean, this was a study that just kind of explored this again in a sleep lab. And I haven't found a lot of, I've done some digging on the research here, but there isn't a lot. Mm. Um, Right. I mean, I think think the earth magnetic field uh, does affect the circadian rhythms. So it yeah, might, might yeah. have to do with something like that, but uh, yeah, like, I mean, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> well, and even seasonal rhythms. So there's circadian rhythm, there's lunar rhythm, then there's circannual rhythms. And circannual rhythms are the seasonal changes. So mm. what we tend to see is that there's a seasonal pattern to melatonin produced in the body. And you know what's really interesting is that people with autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis, they tend to have flares at certain times of year, especially Mm. early spring. And melatonin actually tends to be low. And also vitamin D tends to be low at that time. That's like, Mm. you know, spring is kind of that 
that time of where we are shifting, you know, melatonin needs to get acclimated. So I, I like what you're saying here about, you know, just thinking bigger into the macro because right. things are always changing. And so, you know, I think we have to get our light right. We have to be connected to the seasons. We also need to overcome darkness deficiency. Mm. I think people don't have enough darkness. I think we need to be eating a higher antioxidant based diet. And if you want, we can talk about, can you get enough melatonin from food? And then I think we go into supplementation, right? Mm -hmm. But if we're in our 30s on up, I, I would think that there is a case to be made for including a high quality melatonin supplement. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Like you shouldn't like supplement melatonin for, for children or teenagers because <laughs> naturally they should make a lot of melatonin. Correct. And, you know, there's actually, there was this study that I talked about this all recently where there's a lot of uh, uptick in like melatonin poisoning uh, in children in the United States because parents just give their children like very large amounts of melatonin. Like in one of the studies, they gave like five milligrams, like eight to 10 times a day. And uh, oh my child... goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the child actually died. So uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely not well, for children. And, and sometimes the melatonin for children, you find it in gummies or chewables yeah. or, you know, where you could potentially take more than if it was a tablet or a capsule, right? And we also need to be thinking about how the melatonin is packaged and in what format it's in because melatonin is an antioxidant. So it will break down in light and with exposure to oxygen. So if somebody just has like a big bottle of melatonin gummies and they keep opening it and, you mm. know, first of all, it's interacting with the other things in the gummy, you don't know what you're getting by the time that you get it. And maybe you're making your way through the bottle and now mm. maybe the stability has changed. That's a possibility. Yeah, for sure. And of course, the amounts are not regulated. <laughs> so it's, you know, you're getting like 400% more sometimes than the label says. So yeah, it's, you know, you really have to be careful <laughs> with what kind of a melatonin yeah. you're taking. There was a study on that for sure, where, you know, showing like even under the amount that is mm. on the label, you know, that was a study, I think, with Canadian researchers who had taken like 30 different products off the shelf and mm. analyzed the content. So I think it does really speak to that. You need to have a good quality melatonin, which does bring me to herbatonin, which is um, it's a plant melatonin. So it's not an extract, but it's actually taken right from plants. So, you know, rice, chlorella, alfalfa into this concentrate. And there was a study on it. There was a study on it in which they compared the plant melatonin, which is herbatonin, which I know you know about, versus synthetic melatonin. And I don't think that people realize that 99% of the melatonin supplements that are on the market are actually synthetically created. So mm. back in the 1950s, when we knew that melatonin came from the pineal gland, there was an effort to actually isolate it from the pineal gland of animals. But as you can imagine, that would be very impractical and not sustainable. And so it, soon thereafter, it went into commercial production and was synthesized from things like petrochemicals, right? So different like petroleum, cold ether, and a variety of different starter compounds can be the initiating substrate. And then there are a series of chemical reactions. And in those chemical reactions, what you can see is that you could get the production of contaminants. There's an article from 2018 talking about 13 different possible contaminants, things like thalamides or formaldehyde derivatives. So in this study, they compared herbatonin against synthetic melatonin and they found a dramatic difference between the two and this is what i think biohackers would be into because if you're going to take melatonin you might as well have an amplified response right, right. so in this particular study they looked at anti-inflammatory activity and they found that the herbatonin had up to a you know 646 percent greater anti-inflammatory activity compared to synthetic melatonin it was also able to uh, scavenge free radicals up to 470% more. They looked in a skin cell line and they found that the cellular health was better. The amount of reactive oxygen species was 50% less compared to the, the, the synthetic melatonin cell line. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, finally, if you just look at ORAC, you look at a measure of antioxidant potential, what you see is that the herbitonin is up to 10 times greater. And I think it's because what you have is it's taken from the plant in the form that it is in the plant. So it's got other things in there. It has things like lutein, zeaxanthin, carotenoids. Hmm. You have small amounts of things, but in some way it's working together very synergistically. Right. So with herbitonin, I think it's um, it's a better choice and it comes in doses that are much more realistic and safe. You know, the 0 hmm. 0.3 milligrams and three milligrams in case you need hmm. a higher dose for something like jet lag. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like huge uh, fan of the herpetonin and uh, the 0 0.3 milligrams is, you know, such a good thing to take, like on a more regular basis. You know, I might take that, uh, you know, just for the, you know, it's not like I have like sleep problems or something, but I just take it for the antioxidant and um, yeah. anti-aging uh, benefits to like, just get more of like a more antioxidant rejuvenative sleep. Because I personally think that you know, looking at all this research and uh, just studying about melatonin as a hormone, then uh, yeah, I've come to the conclusion, at least for myself, that uh, that the melatonin is just so powerful in, in your sleep. And a lot of the times, or a lot of the reasons why you you know see like a reduction or you, or you age slower when you're young is because of the higher amounts of melatonin. At least that's what I you know come come to the conclusion of. And when that drops, when you reach adulthood, and when especially the older you get then you know you have like just a small gap or you not not a small like a pretty massive gap in your antioxidant yeah. uh, capacity and uh, recovery and anti-inflammatory pathways that uh, needs to be filled with somehow if you want to like you know optimally age or you know reduce the aging uh, as much as possible so like uh, you know i take the melatonin the herbatonin the smaller dose maybe like pretty much every night maybe like not a, not on every night maybe like five times a week and the three milligrams yeah, i'll take <laughs> I'll take that only if like I'm severely sleep deprived if I have to catch like a flight super early and yeah. I need to just uh, catch up on that sleep or if I have like yeah, jet lag and circadian mismatch. So like the doses are like very good, like a very small dose that you would want to on a, if you take melatonin every night, then yeah, it's probably not a good idea to take like 10 or, you know, five milligrams every night, but you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.3 is like the perfect amount on a nightly basis to take. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I do as well. So when I'm traveling, I take the three milligrams because I may need to just get a reset from the jet lag. Like I'm just returning yesterday. I was on the East Coast and I live on the West Coast of the United States. And so, you know, just even taking that to help me. Um, and plus travel and flying is so toxic, you know, mm. all the radiation, you know, depending on the time of day that you fly. So like you, I take it not just for the time difference and the change with jet lag and sleep patterns and chrono disruption, but I also take it just as um, an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, you know, something to help my body, especially my anti my mitochondrial antioxidants to be better fortified. Because mm. one of the things that we notice, like one of the signs that somebody can be low in melatonin is that, that they have low energy. Mm. You know, that's one of the symptoms of aging. One of the symptoms, you know, fatigue is rampant. I mean, most people have some level of fatigue and it could be connected to hormonal disruption. So cortisol, testosterone, melatonin, I mean, they all play together in the same biochemical sandbox. So, yeah. you know, not to say like you should, um, you know, do high, high doses again, what we're looking at is replenishment, right? Like, let's just fill the gaps. Because as we get older, we just have more gaps. As we live an unhealthy lifestyle, we have more gaps. Hmm. And I think too, you know, just tossing this out there to your audience, you know, blue light blocking glasses can also be helpful. Because, you know, somebody listening might say, Oh, my goodness, like, I live an unhealthy life. I travel so much. I'm on the computer at night. You know, I go and work out at the gym at, at night and it has fluorescent lights, you know, all of these things. So what you may want to do is, you know, I kind of stack it. So the first layer is really be attentive to your light in your environment, right? Like get that first morning bright light as best you can just for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Try to measure your light. I don't know about you, but I measure my light using a light meter on my phone. So I have an app. It's called Light Meter. And I can just use the light on my phone, just the camera, to 
register a number of lux. Lux is the unit of light. So even now, like I'm in front of a window with a lot of natural light, and that's already changing my retina. So I can't be outside because I'm inside talking with you. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, that's just one more way to get more light, right? You got to be smart about like what you're actually getting. And then in my sleeping room, so at night, I've actually measured it because you want it to be under one lux. So there are some recommendations for light exposure. And so if you don't measure it, you don't change it, I think. Like what you don't know can actually, you know, the more you know about like measuring the light and changing the bulbs and having more red hue is is more, you know, it's just going to be help you with the balance, like dimming the lights at night as much as you can. And then I think from there, you've got to look at diet. You know, one of the questions that I get is, hey, Deanna, can I eat a bunch of cherries and just get enough melatonin? Like, can I just have a handful of pistachios and be good? You know, I mean, I don't discount having a good, healthy, quality diet. There's no way. I mean, I look at phytonutrient density, antioxidant levels that you get from food, um, quality protein, balanced fats, all of that stuff. But if you actually, so I've actually cranked the numbers on this. If you wanted to get 0.3 milligrams of melatonin from food, you would have to have over 2,500 cherries. You would need, and I'm basing it on a study where they actually measured the melatonin in cherries, and that can be variable depending on the season, right? So that's not always going to even be the same. If you wanted to get pistachios, because most people say, oh, I saw this on social media, all I need is some pistachios and I'll have enough melatonin. Well, not so much. I mean, you would need over 1,500 raw pistachios to get 0.3 milligrams of melatonin. Wow. So I'm not saying don't eat cherries and don't eat pistachios. Eat them mm-hmm. because they have nutritional merit. But mm-hmm. if you're trying to get melatonin from them, you'd get a stomach ache <laughs> having that much. <laughs> yeah. You know, you'd have to swim in it. You, you would be nonstop eating. And who even knows how that would be absorbed and, right. you know, all of the, the issues with, with these different foods. But eat yeah. a good quality diet for sure. I mean, we all know that's, that's the basics. Yeah, and I mean, you know, if uh, let's say even if you're an adult in your 30s or 40s, your body would make still like, you know, 0.2, maybe if you're exposed to some blue light or something, it's going to make 0.1, for example. So your body would make, you know, or your body will help you in making some melatonin. But, you know, is it enough? Like, is the three, is, a, is the 0.3 milligrams per night enough? Like, as we already talked about, I, we, I think, you know, I don't think it's enough <laughs> for, like, optimal anti-aging and optimal, like, anti-inflammatory benefits and longevity benefits. So you would still probably need, like, a little bit more, you know. Yeah. And, you, and obviously, and even the 0.3 milligrams you would take from herbatonin probably isn't enough. It's just it's going to fill the gap a little bit. And you would still want to pay attention to the other things, like the blue light and the morning sunlight and the dietary components of melatonin. So if you add all those up, then you would get maybe like, you know, 0.6 or 0.5 milligrams of melatonin. And uh, together with the herbatonin, 0.3 milligrams, for example. So, you know, it's still like, it's not like the 0.3 milligrams is going to be enough. Even like I I would, you know, want to, if, if my body would make, the teenage melatonin all my life then that would be pretty good <laughs> i think making making the one milligram of melatonin every night for the rest of my life i think i would age much slower and live a bit longer <laughs> so it's not it's just you know for optimal anti-aging you would still want to make sure that your body makes as much melatonin as it can naturally and then support it with dietary practices lifestyle practices light r- routines and maybe some supplementation as well yeah. And, uh, you know, there's there's one other hack I can give your audience as far as taking a melatonin supplement. Because some people will say to me, hey, Deanna, I, um, you know, I wake up at night after taking melatonin. I thought melatonin is supposed to help me to sleep the whole night. So what melatonin is really good at if you're taking it for sleep and not for its benefits to help with aging is that melatonin is a lot better for helping with what is called sleep latency, meaning that it can help you to go to sleep faster, Hmm. you know, and there have been some studies on that. And uh, what melatonin does too, is it changes your core body temperature. So, you know, like when you're getting ready to go to sleep and you kind of get a little bit chilly and you're like, okay, I'm going to put on my pajamas. I'm getting, I'm going to put a blanket on. I mean, that is when your melatonin is going up uh, is what I think, because it is a hypothermic agent. And so 
you can take it and then, um, you know, for some women who get hot flashes, so they're going through their 50s or their 40s and they've got perimenopause, they're waking up at night, you may actually need a little bit higher of that melatonin and not so much just for getting you to sleep, but maybe to help with, um, you know, kind of that hypothermic aspect that melatonin brings forward, right? Um, now, one thing is like when people say like, oh, you know, um, I, so just to step back, melatonin is both water soluble and fat soluble. So for people who want to take herbatonin and have a more, more delayed response to carry the melatonin effects throughout perhaps a longer portion of the evening, what I often recommend, now this is not based in science, this is just based on clinical, you know, just tips and application, but to take it with a little bit of fat. Mm. So fat will delay that, um, the, the uptake of melatonin, just because fat in general, like lowers stomach emptying and, and changes a lot of those dynamics. If you want to increase the uptake of melatonin, like, let's just say like my husband, he, he will say, well, Deanna, I get groggy in the morning. And I'm like, Mark, you're not taking it at the right time. You need to take it. You know, for most people, it's about an hour before bedtime, but for him, he needs to take it. His metabolism of melatonin is a little bit different. So I told him to take it a few hours before bedtime, like two to three hours and take it with a little bit of, uh, with water so mm. that it, it kind of has longer time. And then the water will move it through, whereas the fat will delay the, the kind of the movement theoretically through the gastrointestinal tract. So you can kind of work with your, and, you know, vitamin D is also uh, fat soluble. So in theory, you know, taking your vitamin D at night might be something that you might want to do, you know, or if people don't want to take another supplement and they just want to take like herbatonin, just to take maybe a little bit of almond butter, like something that's a little bit, um, just, just a small amount, because you don't want to disrupt your sleep by having food, but just get some fat into the body. I think that that could you know, you can kind of modulate, you can delay it with fat and accelerate it with having water and running hmm. it through your system that way. Interesting. So yeah, like just taking it before bed with some water actually makes it run out faster. And uh, you might feel more groggy because of that, or you might wake up in the night. Yeah, I mean, it, you'd have to play with it on your own, like every person's so different. So uh, and this is why having coffee too close to bedtime is not only disruptive for your sleep, but it actually competes for an enzyme with melatonin. So mm. you've got to look at all of your nighttime behaviors, like, right. um, but yes, like in general, you might want to think about like when you're taking the supplement, like, do you need it an hour before bedtime? That's usually like the time frame, and you can take it with water. You can take it many times. I just swallow the herbatonin. I'm good either way. Like it doesn't affect me to have the fat or the water. And I just, it's such a small capsule. And by the way, herbatonin is packaged in an airtight sealed um, package. It's like a, a it's foiled in, mm. right? So it doesn't okay. have the exposure to air and to light if you keep it in its package, right? So you're opening one capsule at a time and taking it out. So mm. you're preserving the integrity of the melatonin longer. Yeah. So that's just something to think about as well. Mm. Yeah, because most of the melatonins, they're just inside a bottle. You know, sitting there together, <laughs> and when right. a hundred times, a hundred times over the course of a few months, then yeah, yeah, the last melatonins are going to be pretty ineffective, I would imagine. Exactly. Yeah. So, be thinking about that. You know, some people wonder about like their effects from the melatonin, and I'll say, do you have other things in that melatonin supplement? Because it could actually be working at cross purposes. Like, hmm. it's not always good to have a kitchen sink formula and like bring melatonin together with all these other things right. um, because it may actually change the metabolism. You know, other people that are on medication, like a lot of medications interact with melatonin. So you need to be aware of that. Like mm -hmm. you could be changing up your metabolism of melatonin. Even men and women um, have different bioavailability of melatonin. Surprisingly, women have a better uptake than men do, which I don't know what the reason is for that, but I just know that um, 
you know, that, that has been shown in, in one, one study. So you might have to be thinking about the time of the month, like thinking about the moon and just track your sleep as you're taking herbatonin. What is going to change your sleep? Because maybe it's not the, the herbatonin, it's not the melatonin per se, but it's all these other factors that you have to be looking at, right? Hmm. So um, I just think we have to look broadly, like if we're super stressed, you know, we're traveling a lot, we have a lot of oxidative stress, even athletes can have a lot of oxidative stress, as we know. So even for them, I think having a supplemental melatonin like herbatonin can be really important for helping to restore that balance through the mitochondria. Mm. Right. Uh, what about like, the safety side? Because I mean, many people you know, say that it's uh, unsafe or they're afraid of using it because it's a hormone, like you said. So um, what, what's the, like, what's the safety dose of melatonin as a supplement? And uh, yeah, like how much is too much, like you said, like that you, you shouldn't take too much. Yeah, no, it's a good question, you know. And of course, everybody has to ask their own clinician. This uh, We're not giving any kind of prescription or advice here. But in general, if we look at the studies and like the margin of safety, what I see out there for just overall cellular health, helping with the regulation of the mitochondria and looking at a variety of different effects, we're looking at between 0 0.3 to one milligram. And that's just kind of like, that's a low, that's like a healthy endogenous physiologic level, right? We've been talking a lot about how do we just replenish what we're losing? And for some people, they're losing it faster than others, you know, um, because again, they're their light exposure is high, their stress level is high, et cetera. They're not eating a good diet, all of those things. And then when it comes to shift work and jet lag, that's a little bit of a novel application. Um, so there is a way to use melatonin, such as herbatonin with shift workers. So, you know, having that low level over time to help with resetting the circadian rhythm. So anywhere between, you know, zero point three to six milligrams, you know, looking at shift work and then jet lag, you know, in general thinking about, you know, if I'm, if I'm going from the West coast to the East coast, I usually like to think about, you know, three time zones, therefore three milligrams of, of melatonin. So I take that three milligrams of herbatonin and I take sometimes, you know, and, and you hear this from different people, they start the melatonin before they have even left. So before they've even left their location, you know, where, where their home base is, they start taking the low level of melatonin. They start to go to bed a little bit earlier every night, if they can, like three to four nights before they travel. And they take the 0 0.3. And then when they get to their destination, that night, they would take the three milligrams for about three days thereafter until their sleeping is back to normal. And that should help restore it or at least, um, you know, get them back on track faster. Mm -hmm. So when you ask about like margin of safety, you know, everybody's a little bit different. So again, we have to take into account lifestyle, medication use. Does somebody drink coffee throughout the day? What's their response to light? What's their sleep hygiene like? But in general, I think you and I are saying the same thing, which is going with a more physiologic dose for kind of like more the the broad approach of melatonin and all of its many different functions so that 0 0.3 milligrams you know up to about a one milligram is what mm. i would say gotcha right yeah i've also seen and you know the natural melatonin production that's also like another misconception like is it going to shut down your natural melatonin production and you're like screwed <clears throat> after you stop taking melatonin or what's the case there yeah uh that that seems to be like the most popular question i get you know there is this fear because the reason why people are asking it it's actually a really good question is because with with many hormones you know there is a biofeedback mm -hmm. right so if the pituitary is producing a signaling hormone to the adrenals eventually the adrenals signal back you know and the cortisol creates this ne negative biofeedback, right? So like we don't continue to produce. And so melatonin, because it flexes beyond being a hormone, it's just a little bit different in that way. So because people have asked me the question, I actually went into the studies just to look at 
are there studies that look to see whether or not we impact endogenous production from taking melatonin? And there were up to four different studies that I had found that were prospectively actually addressing that question. So they found that the melatonin supplement did not impact endogenous production. And then there's also kind of like the lineage of studies looking at like three decades worth of studies looking at using it in people with cancer. And that was much higher dose of melatonin supplements. They haven't documented that effect. Now, the one thing I'll mention is that you can't, if, if you think of melatonin in its true sense as an endocrine hormone, so an endocrine hormone would have receptors on a cell that it would have to plug into, right? And then you start to see that ripple through effect to the clock genes or all the other aspects of DNA and such. So you can get, if you're taking too high of an amount, you might see a saturation of the receptors. So that's why I think if you're taking too much melatonin, you may actually just super saturate those receptors right? And what I think is is healthy in the body is to have kind of, um, you know, the, the activation and then the deactivation, the letting go, right? And not to just have melatonin sitting on those receptors all the time. So that's just something to think about. There isn't a lot of science on it. There was, you know, Dr. Russell Ryder is one of the premier researchers in this whole area of melatonin science. And so these are some of his um, his principles, his guidance too, based on the research. So, but to answer the question, does taking melatonin re result in decreased levels? We do not see that in science. And again, everybody is a little bit different. So your level, your threshold of what works for you is going to vary. So to work yeah. with a practitioner to really figure that out, or just kind of go within those guardrails of what we're saying here with that, the low dose, the physiologic dose of replenishing what you're losing with age. And you know, if you really want to know your melatonin levels, you can get a sense of those in a laboratory test. So there are different labs out there like Dutch, um, which does a nice mm. uh, type of cycle mapping where they look at different hormones. They look at urinary metabolites of melatonin. So looking at different times throughout the day to look at kind of that melatonin response and kind of the only thing is that because melatonin can change so rapidly because of the darkness or the light, you have to be sure that you're maintaining kind of like your consistent level of your activity and your light exposure, because otherwise you may get a, a skewed reading from that, right? Mm. So, but if you absolutely want to know, let's just say you're a shift worker, you know, you're a nurse or you're a doctor, you're, you're, you're working, maybe you work in a mine or, you know, you work in darkness, you're an x-ray technician, and you're really concerned about your light and your dark exposure, and you just want to get clear, you can work with a clinician to look at your symptoms, any kind of health conditions, they can do your gene variants, some of them, especially if they're functionally trained, you know, so I, I teach, um, you know, functional medicine principles. And so, you know, that's why you, you really have to plug into the person. And I think if people want numbers, they want laboratory tests, you know, there are ways to look at just urinary melatonin metabolism. And from that inferring whether or not people need melatonin. Mm. I was actually pretty glad I, I did do my urinary <laughs> melatonin levels and, um, I was all good on, you know, this was a way, cause I was already taking herbitonin, but when I did the lab test, it was like my urine metabolites show that they were in a good, healthy range. So I was thinking, okay, I'm spot on on my dose, right? Like that kind of gave me positive feedback that it was like, okay, this seems to be within the range that is acceptable or at least established by a lab that I, I know and trust. Mm. Nice. Yeah. I've actually seen also that in the 90s, they used melatonin as a contraceptive in like very large amounts, like 75 milligrams. Have you like, what's like the research you've seen about that? Well, you know, that question often will come up about, you know, how does melatonin change other hormones? Uh, it does. You know, we are connected in kind of this hormone web the most notable connection that we see is cortisol and melatonin like they're like brother and sister 
So, you know, cortisol comes up high in the morning, melatonin comes up high at night. So they kind of like change guards. So with respect to, um, you know, looking at fertility and, and seeing these changes, I think, you know, we need to be cautious with high levels like that of, um, you know, what we might possibly see. There is a potential that it could be connected into estrogen, progesterone, um, testosterone, you know, and we even see that as a child starts to go through puberty, there can be this dynamic shift, right? So, but I, I think, you know, if we keep everything physiologic, what the body normally makes, then we don't run into all of these issues where we're, it's almost like a spider web. Like when we have like such a high level of melatonin, we start to tug on that, that web, right? And we don't know where we're going to go for the individual in terms of their respective hormones. So that could be different for a postmenopausal woman versus a premenopausal woman. That could be different for an athletic man versus a sedentary man. So I think, you know, when <laughs> we, we just have to take a lot of things into account and not just say more is better. Let's right. just talk. This melatonin sounds so good. Let me just take more because you know, as, as you and I know, like even with something like beta carotene, more is not always better beta, beta carotene, you know, and we see that, you know, when we start to take things in high amounts that go beyond what is just naturally occurring, sometimes we can start to get a skewed effect or an untoward effect. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I haven't, you know, I've only seen one paper about the contraceptive effects. Apparently, they did use it in the 90s. <laughs> I don't know if they do it anymore. Probably not. But, uh, you know, the, the association between melatonin use and uh, lower testosterone isn't isn't there either. <laughs> like, the, in the study, in the US, at least, they've done many studies looking at melatonin use and uh, testosterone levels and stuff like that. And they find that it has no uh, association or it doesn't reduce the testosterone levels at all. And when right. it comes to like puberty, then, uh, you know, obviously there's the fear that if you take melatonin, it's going to postpone puberty in some ways, you know, <laughs> some, may, some people might think it's actually going to be good for longevity or something. If you delay the pu puberty or you have higher melatonin levels, but, uh, even then they don't find that the melatonin use in children would affect like the pubertal development. Yeah. At least, like in most of the studies that I've seen, like there was only one Dutch study but uh, it wasn't like a randomized clinical trial, obviously. And there's many things that also could affect uh, those results. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, exactly. I, I think um, we need more data if we're going to start talking about melatonin and estrogen, melatonin and testosterone. And I think, too, just to circle back from some of the earlier comments where we started off where, you know, children, even teenagers, I don't think need melatonin. <laughs> you know, yeah, sure. like unless there's a specific indication for which we know that melatonin would be good for, you know, aside from all of the dietary intervention, the physical activity, the lifestyle environment that they're sleeping in. And, you know, I, I think that kids today, I mean, they're on devices a lot, you know, all mm. the time, right? Then they go to sleep with their device and they're scrolling and they've got that blue light. So it's like, let's just start with some of the basics first, rather than be thinking about like bringing melatonin into that population, because I, I just don't think that that would be like a first line yeah. approach to, to helping them to have better sleep or a better um, puberty experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at the fatalities of the melatonin overdose in children, then most of those cases was just parents giving the melatonin to the child so that they would sleep or you know that they would stop right. screaming or something like that <laughs> which is you know very yeah. irresponsible from uh, the parent but again like yeah if you just optimize the basics like the light environment and for children or teenagers make sure that you don't just scroll the phone which is a massive inhibitor of melatonin production and disrupts sleep and all those things so I've, you know those are the first things that you should do and uh when it comes to even like, and when it comes to the babies or infants then actually the funny thing about it is also that uh mother's breast milk also has melatonin yes through yeah the thank you for through mentioning through that yeah and in fact it's thought that even um, babies that have colic or you know 
bouts of crying and unrest, you know, is that connected to low melatonin and, you know, to start to stage increasing levels of melatonin just as the endogenous production ramps up. So it'd be interesting to see. I don't, I'm not aware of a study in babies that are breastfed versus um, given milk just, or, you know, different kinds of milk or formula, just in terms of like their ramping up of melatonin. That'd be interesting to look at. There is an animal study that comes to my mind of um, where they gave the animals, um, the mothers, melatonin, and that was able to modify, I, I, from my recollection, the gut microbiome of the offspring. So there could be certain things that it's like, we don't have to give it to the child, but maybe we can ensure that the mother and, you know, is, is well equipped. Like she's tracking on her melatonin levels, you know, depending on the age that she decides to get pregnant. But yeah, um, I do remember this study as far as like maternal melatonin supplementation was able to help to protect against a lot of the issues like the immune inflammatory issues seen in the gut in the in the offspring so that's interesting we need do need to be right. thinking about maybe it's not the child themselves but it's the parents and how they're coming into it with the best i mean because that oocyte right the egg and the sperm you know are, are going to be especially the sperm is rich in in mito in in the uh in melatonin mitochondria the egg is as well and if they're both at their optimum you know, theoretically, now we have, um, you know, less oxidative stress and more chance for something like fertility. Right. So I think we we need to be thinking about that. It's it's good that you bring that up. It, it's true, you know. Um, yeah, I was thinking, you know, th there's also, you know, the daily diurnal aspect to it so that, you know, the mother has higher melatonin, or she should have higher melatonin in the evening. And yeah, you know, if so you breastfeed the child before bed, yeah. Given that she has melatonin in her system, not under the blue lights, for example, or, you know, in a dimmer environment, she would give the child this uh, melatonin rich breast milk, which, you know, for the exactly. child who is less than three months of age, <laughs> she would get this natural melatonin supplement that would help them to sleep. And, you know, a lot of the times the infants don't sleep is that they don't get the melatonin because the baby formulas don't have melatonin. And most women, I would imagine, don't breastfeed. And, uh, you know, especially if they do, they're probably doing it like either under the blue light. So the yeah. mother doesn't have melatonin in the breast milk or they, you know, you know, uh, pump the milk in the daytime and then feed it in the night to the child, which <laughs> makes makes sure that the milk doesn't have melatonin either. So, you, exactly. you know, if you want to make sure the infant sleeps, then you have to uh, get them melatonin. Obviously, don't give the melatonin supplement, but give them like milk that has some melatonin that would you know, give, fill their gap, which, because they don't make melatonin if they're uh, infants. I love how you connect all the dots that that is so good. And it's often, you know, dismissed. So many people are just focused on melatonin for sleep, but if we, gosh, we can look at preconception, we can look at, you know, lactation, uh, we can look at aging. I mean, there's so many different aspects. And, and I think when it comes to ensuring that a baby is, you know, sleeping better. And, you know, why is it that some children sleep better than others? You know, is mm -hmm. that related to melatonin? Is it related to even their gut microbiome, which could be influenced by the melatonin, right? right. You know, one other thing I, I want to, I just entered my mind that I wanted to leave your audience with is that it kind of goes back to the article that we wrote about melatonin being like the next vitamin D. There, mm -hmm. there was one study that actually showed that when you correct and you help vitamin D levels, you actually help melatonin, mm. that there's some correlation between melatonin and vitamin D. So think of how many people are vitamin D insufficient, deficient. And so I want everybody to like leave this conversation with thinking of the seasonal changes in vitamin D. I mean, just personally, I get my vitamin D measured twice a year. I get it in March and I get it in September, October, and I just had mine done. So I kind of want to see like what happens at the end of winter, like when my vitamin D should be at its lowest. And so would melatonin would also be low during that time of year. Mm. And then what about vitamin D potentially at my highest, which would be after summer. So we need to keep our vitamin D in check. 
And if we're overdoing vitamin D, I would like to put out the question, are we changing up melatonin as well? Like, mm -hmm. I think some people go a little bit too high on vitamin D as well. You know, the Goldilocks principle to me applies here. Mm -hmm. And I know that one of the things, like when people do really high doses of vitamin D, if they're not taking magnesium, they can actually lead into a potential magnesium insufficiency or deficiency because we need magnesium for the conversion to active vitamin D, right? Mm -hmm. wow. So, and we need magnesium for sleep. <laughs> so, uh, and for so many body processes. So um, I, I just want to leave people there thinking about the triangle. If you can imagine a triangle in your mind of like melatonin, vitamin D, magnesium, like there is a connection here with those three. And, um, you know, as you and I started off talking, we know that vitamin D is used for so many different functions in the body. It's beyond being a vitamin. I think it was mistermed. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's a, it's a vitamin, but it's, it's doing a lot more just like melatonin is. And that's why I contend, I want to leave this conversation by saying that I do think that melatonin can justifiably be a nutrient. We need it. You know, it's, it's similar to like vitamin D being used for so many different things. And we need to uh, sometimes correct our levels of vitamin D, very similar with melatonin. Um, it's flexing to being more, more than just a hormone. Right. So, yeah. yeah, that's true. So, so I want to just ask that, uh, so is the melatonin naturally higher in the winter because there's more darkness or is it more higher in the summer where is more sunlight or what was the connection there? Yeah, theoretically it would be higher in the, in the winter months and, <laughs> uh, we would have lower vitamin D, but again, we're, we're pulling on that. Um, I had somebody ask me before just about, you know, and and I think we need more research there because, you know, different populations of people, um, you know, might exhibit different characteristics seasonally in terms of their behaviors and what they do. Like they may actually have more light during the winter, right? Like where they're living even more right. indoors or not getting the bright light. So one of the things that I think is really important, especially in the darker months, is to make sure that you get the bright light first thing in the morning. Because while melatonin is produced during the darkness, it also needs kind of that set of that bright light in the in the morning. So people with seasonal affective disorder, this may be a population where there's a dysregulation of the circadian tone, right? So it's not just getting the darkness of which we get a lot of in the winter months, but it's also getting the light. So that's off during the winter months and that could disturb melatonin in some people. Gotcha. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was, it's, it's been great and uh, yeah, super, you know, fascinating things about melatonin and I'm glad that you shared it with us. Um, before I ask my last question, where can people learn more about you and your work? So um, I would say Symphony Natural Health is a great website where you can find out a lot of information on the Herbitonin. So, uh, and then there's also another website, which is just all research and it's called Phyto Melatonin. So P-H-Y-T-O melatonin.com. And then my own personal website is deannaminick.com. And so I've put together just more recently too, looking at you know, um, my one of my interests is in chronobiotics. So chronobiotics would be things like the melatonin, things like polyphenols, and how even, you know, time of year when you're born could determine so much of, you know, health and kind of uh, different conditions that could evolve. So you'll see some of that on my blogs. And uh, I have a number of different resources that people can download. And one of them is actually on melatonin if people want it. Nice. We'll put all the links in the show notes. Okay. And my last question is, um, what's the one piece of advice or habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Stress less. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it. I mean, it sounds so simplistic, um, you know, but, I, you know, I'm almost 53 and I kind of feel like, wow, you know, why did I worry so much about all of that stuff? Like so early in life, like, but, you know, it's all part of the process. So I, I don't have this feeling of regret or remorse. Um, but if I was talking to my younger self, um, 
I would say eat a better diet, you know, mm. get more activity. Um, don't stress so much, you know, kind of like all the basics and just enjoy, enjoy life. I think that that's really important. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Stress is definitely something that, you know, ages everyone faster. <laughs> it does. Stress ages us. Um, and, you know, like gray hair, wrinkling skin, you know, all the things that people are so preoccupied about. And by the way, I have this feeling with, I, I don't fear aging at all. Like what mm. I don't want is like when I don't have functionality, you know, like mm. when I can't be independent, when I can't like feel a good quality of life, but like, it doesn't matter to me if I'm 53 or 83. Like I, some of my role models, like I just see them aging in such a beautiful way. And I just think of their brains, their neuronal plasticity and all of those connections that they made. So, yeah, I mean, I think every part of the life cycle, we're, we're learning something about ourselves, right? And it's all mm. relevant, no matter, no matter what. So yeah, stay healthy as best you can and stay in that, that coherence of um, feeling content, creative and colorful, as I like to say. Mm. Yeah, well, it's, it's been great to talk with you. And yeah, thanks for sharing all this amazing information with us. Oh, and thank you so much. I'll, yeah, looking forward to maybe a few more future studies or something like that and your future work. Thanks so much. But do you want to achieve and maintain biological youth? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to add healthy years to their life. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details.